been a wonderful, uh, inspirational morning so far. And uh, to be given this opportunity to try to stitch it all together is quite an honor. I've, um, my students often ask me, what is it about fish that fascinates you so? Uh, because I spend a lot of my time looking at New England's fisheries. Um, I spend a lot of time, my work focuses upon the history of the New England fisheries and its change over time. And my students think what they think. I don't want to know what they think of my obsession with fish. But I look at fish as rather an indicator. Um, in the course of my lifetime, I've lived with a probably one of the most stubborn and endemic environmental problems this nation, says, this nation has yet to grapple with. And that's, in particular, that's the collapse of the George's Bank fishery uh, beginning in 1986. I was a 16-year-old kid in high school uh, in Falmouth, Massachusetts when this happened. And the first, it was for the first time I heard people talk about, the first time in a 150-year history of the fishery on George's Bank, I heard people talk about the potential for the commercial extinction of George's Bank cod. 1986, our landings went from, uh, excuse me, the spawning stock biomass went from about 100,000 metric tons of fish, uh, Professor Ledbetter will be interested in that, down to about 50,000 metric, ton, uh, 50, metric tons. But when landings, uh, when catch rebounded after 1986, we went back to business as usual. But by 1994, our spawning stock biomass had dropped down to about one-tenth of where it had been about a decade before. The problem was is that while landings returned back to what they had been, we were fishing down the, the entire adult spawning stock of that fishery, leaving us with next to nothing. Well, in 1986, people sort of went along business as usual. It's a momentary blip. Things came back, can't be a problem. Well, in 1994, we realized there was a much bigger problem going on here. And in particular, you saw fishermen, you saw scientists, anthropologists, policy wonks, regulators, politicians, all turning to looking at every aspect of this fishery we could probably, that we could identify. We looked at the biology of the fish. We looked at the productivity of the ecosystem. We looked at the distribution networks on shore. We looked at community structure amongst fishing towns. And we looked at everything. Uh, and still, we have now, in 2011, still a fraction, about 10% of the spawning stock biomass on George's Bank that we had when I was a 16-year-old kid. This has been my environmental doppelganger for my entire adult life. When I say we looked at everything, there was one thing we didn't look at that may not be apparent to a lot of the other hardworking, intelligent, bright, really smart professionals that have tackled this problem since it unfolded in the early 1990s. They all looked at the fishery itself. They looked at the failure as a failure of the ecosystem or, and I include fishermen as part of that ecosystem, the industrial organization of, that res of the harvesting of that resource. I'm an environmental historian, and I take a longer view at things. I, take a, I, I tend to look at things that change over time. I look at larger issues that, say, that sometimes emerge as invisible to us, but you, that we take for granted every day. And so I wonder, <clears throat> as I looked at this over the years, I wonder if we've been getting the problem about the Georges Bank fishery backwards. Rather than looking at it, at it as an ecosystem that's failing our economic system, I wonder, if our economic system is failing our ecosystem. And in particular, if we're trying to use an economic system, a version of capitalism born out of the 20th century mentalities that defined it, are we using that 20th century version of capitalism and are trying to apply it to a 21st century natural resource base that is perhaps more clearly than any other natural resource base in this nation a representative of the 21st century reality of finite natural resources. The reality, the economic reality, we have to face up to uh, in the coming century. And if so, maybe the solution isn't trying to get fish to grow more fish. I don't know how you would do that anyway. But rather, <clears throat> we need to change our economic system, change the way we pursue capitalism. Now, I want to be clear today, today, I have this really wonderful little icon that, well, it's a little off color. Maybe that's why it's not up there right now. Um, <clears throat> I am no fan of free market solutions. I am very, very leery of market solutions. I think they have failed more often than they've succeeded. And I think when, Adam, when I read Adam Smith, 
I read Adam Smith, His Wealth of Nations, as a cautionary tale that has to define the invisible hand of the market before it pummels us as it has for at least 200 years. But I can't deny, as critical as I am of free market solutions in an unregulated context, I can't deny the fact that capitalism over the last 500 years has proved remarkably flexible. It emerged out of a feudal market economy. It adapted to the expansion of global trade and mercantilism in the 17th and 18th centuries. It accommodated the advent of industrial production. And we've retooled it again in the 21st century to do whatever it is we are going to call this version of capitalism today. I think there are many different labels out there. I'm not going to get into that. So clearly, as financial organizations and as product, uh, systems of productivity have changed over time, Capitalism has adapted as well. But that's not the only thing that changes capitalism. When we ended slavery, when women entered the workforce, when we put civil rights as a top priority, not only politically, but socially and culturally, all those changes change the way we do business in this country. New people with new ideas and new motivations entered into a formal economy in ways they had been prevented from doing so before. And in doing so, we've radically redefined the way our American economic system has functioned just since 1866 and, frankly, since World War II again. So capitalism doesn't respond only to changes within the economic structure and the financial structure. It changes to us. As we change our value systems and our cultural attitudes, capitalism changes with it. In short, Capitalism is us. It's not some abstract, distant thing. The market isn't some abstract, distant thing. It isn't something that's beyond our control. It's merely an academic shorthand for a collection of behaviors and attitudes and values that we surround the allocation of goods and services. It's a remarkably wonderful tool, certainly. I use it all the time in class. But we tend to forget that we have the power and have been exercising the power to change capitalism to adapt to what we think sh things should be in throughout the history of this nation. So I think that George's Bank, the collapse of the George's Bank fishery in microcosm, offers us a unique opportunity, um, <clears throat> an opportunity to try to find ways to adapt our economic system to our ecosystem. I think that's the 21st century problem that we have to face. How we're going to do that, I don't know. Um, the reality is, is that it's probably well underway already. Every time this country is faced with very shocking, visible environmental catastrophes, whether it's burning rivers or acid rain scorched hillsides, clear-cut mountaintops, strip mining, when we see these images of our power to do things to this world beyond any of our dreams, we respond. And usually in those situations, we responded through legislation. That legislation, in turn, the hallmark environmentalist legislation of the 20th century, has in turn shaped and changed and forced businesses, many of whom were willing to change, to change the way they do business. And we as consumers have incurred the costs, and we've borne those costs of a cleaner way of doing business. So we can change this, and we're beginning to change capitalism to accommodate the 21st century environmental finiteness that we're starting to recognize is likely true. In the marine realm, it's a little slower. We don't see the damage that we do to the ocean. We are, my office is sitting right on the mouth of the Thames River, and I look out every day, and I see beautiful ocean. Well, Long Island Sound. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. <laughs> it counts. <clears throat> it's gorgeous. It's also, compared to, biologically, compared to what it had been just a century ago, a wasteland. That might be a bit extreme. There is still life in it, but not nearly what it once was. But we, because we can't see it, we've been slow to respond to this. That's starting to change. And so when I say we need to change capitalism, I have to admit, I don't have a clear blueprint on how to do it. But other people do, other people I've run into in the course of my fisheries work. There's one fisherwoman at a point, Judith, in Rhode Island in particular. Her name is Sarah Schumann. Um, she's a, uh, uh, an inshore fisherman at a point, Judith. She works in the, uh, the Alaskan salmon uh, canneries. And she started, in, started an organization called eatingwiththeecosystem.org. And what she does is she tries to teach 
inform, educate consumers about how to match their eating behaviors and their market decisions with the seasonal variability inherent within our regional ecosystem. So instead of eating the same species of fish 365 days a year, you see what's available, what's migrating through on the way to the Atlantic feeding grounds off of Canada, or what's coming back from the Atlantic feeding grounds off of Canada. So instead of eating cod, you'd eat bluefish, you'd eat herring, you'd eat mackerel, you'd eat stripers, you'd eat uh, flounders as they come inshore and offshore. Some of these are migratory, some of these are not but you vary things up based upon what's locally abundant. This is how fishermen used to fish 200 years ago. This is not rocket science. But we've forgotten that, and Sarah's work is informing us and teaching us and showing us that we can do that. She's also telling us how to use lesser utilized species in ways we hadn't used before. And frankly, if it's breaded and fried, who cares what species of fish is in your fish and chips? <laughs> I don't. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, what I see in the Georges Bank fishery the Georges Bank cod fishery, is not a miner's canary. I used to think of it as a miner's canary, as something that was dying because our economic system was no longer compatible with our ecosystem. I don't see it that way anymore. I see it as the fulcrum by which we figure out new, new paths, new directions, new tools, new understandings on how to change our economic system to deal with the, what I think is the most pressing challenge our society has for the 21st century, and that is our finite natural resource base. We're gonna do it, I don't know how, but smart people will. Sarah's one of them, and hopefully there's a few of you in here today. Thank you.